I learned that you can DNF a video too, and sometimes it might be good for you. Hi, I'm Jane at Twofold Books, and I usually have more than one perspective or answer. Yesterday was my birthday, and I read aloud to my camera all day trying to film a video for you, but I'm seriously bummed out. They're doing construction around my building, and it, it hasn't been this loud. And now today, on my birthday, apparently it's just sawing day. So, I don't know, hopefully the audio for this is not terrible. It may receive heavy editing if you just can't handle. It's so sad. It was going to be so long and take so much time and still not be the video that I wanted it to be. So instead, today I'll do a little summary of the book and I'll keep in some clips of me reading for posterity and hopefully this is something we can all enjoy. If you are a fan of the Westing game, this is by the same author, so definitely check out this book. It is still in print, I checked and so people can find it if you're interested. I would also not be surprised if there are a lot of libraries that have this book. This is one of my favorite books. It's been a favorite of mine for I don't know how long. I don't know when the first time I or my family read this book. Um, this copy is an old school library copy. It's naked. The letters are wearing off. Uh, it still has the checkout card. The last checkout date is 1991. It's not me, by the way. I think it must have been pulled out of circulation before I was even in junior high, um, and so we must have got it at some other used book sale. So The Tattooed Potato and Other Clues is an artist mystery novel where everything gets tied up in a cute little bow at the end. The Tattooed Potato and Other Clues by Ellen Raskin, published in 1975. The Mystery in Cobble Lane 1. A lonely figure stood in Cobble Lane, studying the red brick house numbered 12. Nervously, she clicked a broken fingernail. No signs of life could be seen behind the muntined, was that the right word? Windows framed by quaint blue-green shutters. No people, no cars, troubled this shy Greenwich Village street. Only Dickory. Dickory had never been in Cobble Lane before, although she had lived all of her 17 years just one mile away. One mile away in a decaying tenement that rumbled with passing trucks and shuddered above the subway's roar. Here, hidden by the lane's narrow bend, the small historic houses stood huddled in silence, untouched by the frantic city that had grown up around them. Fumbling through her shoulder bag, the trespasser found the notice she had removed from the school bulletin board that morning. Wanted. Art student to assist well-known portrait painter. Three to six, Monday through Friday, all day Saturday. Good pay. Must be native New Yorker. Neat, well-organized. Quiet, observant. Apply, Garson. 12 Cobble Lane. Dickory wanted that job. But what if Garson asked to see her portfolio? It was one thing to get accepted into art school with the street scenes done with magic markers, but... Dickory bit off the ragged edge of her fingernail. How would she introduce herself if Garson himself answered the door? She would say nothing. Just hand him the notice. She would be quiet quiet and observant. Observant Dickory counted the windows, ten in all, three on the second floor, two on the first floor, two in the same... Someone was watching her from a basement window. No, no one was there. It seemed as if the house itself was watching her as she clutched the cast iron newel, climbed up one, two, three steps of the brownstone stoop, rang the bell, and waited before the eight-paneled door. Painted the same blue-green as the shutters. At last, a bolt lock turned. A man in blue jeans opened the door and took the notice from her outstretched hand. Come in, 
I'm Garson. Silent Dickory stepped into the old house to become paint sorter, brush cleaner, treasure keeper, spy, detective, and once again, companion to murder. Double murder. So that's a gripping beginning. Uh, murder, details, vocab words, I'm excited. The main character, Dickory Duck, is a young woman who is in art school and she applies for an apprenticeship with a well-known artist named Garson. By the way, what's your name? Dickory, she replied, staring into a drawer stuffed with monocles and medals, eye patches and false teeth. Is that your first name or your last? Dickory sighed. That was not a fair question from a man who called himself Garson, just Garson. <sighs> My last name is Doc, she replied combatively, waiting for the usual guffaw. Garson didn't even smile. And the minute she walks through the door, her life changes. This artist is asked by a chief of detectives to help him solve crimes. There's two men who live downstairs who are a little aggressive and suspicious. She uh, makes friends with an art student in her school. And as they're solving crimes, they're looking at the crimes from an artist's perspective, from a lens of looking through disguises and looking for details that maybe aren't typical detective questions. Do you know the difference between a primitive painter and a creative artist? Garson asked. Dickory, surprised, spun around. She had expected to be questioned about the costumes or the house or the pants presser collection or Fragonard. Sorry, I didn't mean that to be a question. I'm just explaining the rules of the game. Dickory returned to the shoes. The difference is this, Garson explained. The primitive painter meticulously draws in every brick on a building because he knows the bricks are there. But the creative artist can suggest bricks with a few strokes of his brush. The creative artist is concerned not with facades, but with the inner structure, with the truth of what he sees. This was a lesson for me, this moment, this idea that I could suggest bricks instead of meticulously draw them. I think before this book, I was more likely to meticulously draw every detail and then be dissatisfied with it. I wanted to be an artist when I was a little girl. I took painting classes and I did every extra art assignment that I could in elementary school and had a good relationship with all my art teachers. So I really wanted to be an artist and I loved reading this book about art. Seeing the structure behind the facade, seeing the truth behind the disguise. That's what I mean by being observant, Garson said. Remember that in answering my questions. Understand? What I can teach you is how to observe, Garson continued. How to see through frills and facades, how to see through disguises, how to see with an artist's eye. And the sim simplest way to teach that is to play our little game. The cases all have real fun names. The mystery in number 12 Cobble Lane, the case of the horrible hairdresser, the case of the face on the $5 bill is a forgery case. The case of the full-sized midget is a jewel heist. The case of the disguised disguise is where the climax of the book happens. And the case of the confusing corpus depends on corpus having a different meaning in the world of detectives and the world of art. So as Dickory and Garson put their minds to these various cases, Dickory learns a lot about how Garson works and thinks, and we learn a lot about Dickory's past and also her insecurities. Her main insecurity being that her name is Dickory Doc, which means she gets all these nicknames, and whenever the police chief comes through, he makes a nursery rhyme about her name. Hickory Dickory Doc, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck two, and up he flew, just like Hickory Dickory Doc. I just made that up, Chief Quinn said, pleased with himself. Her friend from art school, George, is a good friend for her because he also has an unusual name. His name is George Washington III, so he knows all about the jokes that can come from names. George Washington nodded. First in war, first in peace, first in the heart of his countrymen. 
unless you'd rather discuss the cherry tree. I'm the last one to joke about names, George. He smiled. It's really George Washington III, but no relation to the father of our country. One of the characters that's really important to me is Isaac Bickerstaff. Dickory first encounters Isaac Bickerstaff when she's accomplishing a task for Garson, and Isaac comes lumbering in and she's frightened of him. Suddenly, Dickory became aware of footsteps in the apartment she had just left. Thudding feet clumped up the curved staircase from the living room, coming closer, closer toward the darkening door. Cringing against the hallway wall, Dickory stared up at a huge, disfigured monster of a man, a jagged scar cut across his smashed face twisting his mouth into a horrible grin, blinding one eye white and unblinking. Dickory screamed. The giant lumbered toward her, arms outstretched, fingers jerking wildly. She screamed again. I didn't expect you to take me so literally when I said, give a yell, Garson said flatly from the top of the stairs. Oh, I see, Isaac is helping out. The awful Isaac bent down flipped the carton onto a massive shoulder and carried it up to the studio floor. Trembling, Dickory sank down on the bottom step. Sorry, I should have told you about Isaac Bickerstaff, Garson said nonchalantly, tripping down the stairs. He lives in the guest room under the front stoop. Isaac is quite harmless, and are you all right? I'm fine, just fine, Dickory replied pulling herself up by the banister. After all, I am a native New Yorker. Exactly. Then a little later we learn that Isaac is a character who has had a traumatic brain injury and is now deaf mute. In one word, only one word, describe Isaac Bickerstaff. Who? Dickory stalled for time. Isaac, the man who lives under the front stoop. Oh. Dickory sat back on her heels and closed her eyes. She shuddered at the remembered features of the misshapen giant. Take your time, Garson said, between sips of his drink. But remember, one word, the most important word. Isaac Bickerstaff seemed too big to squeeze into one word. Scar face didn't indicate his size. Neither did one-eyed. On the other hand, huge or giant didn't indicate his scars or his scariness monster. That was it. Monster, Dickory said. Garson shook his head. You disappoint me. Poor gentle Isaac, a monster? That's not only inaccurate, it's uncharitable. The word for Isaac is deaf mute. Now Dickory remembered the flying fingers, the vacant stare. Shamed by her stupidity, she stood up as her hopes for the job crashed down all around her. She decided to fight for another chance. Deaf mute is two words, she challenged. One word, Garson replied. Deaf hyphen mute. But Isaac Bickerstaff is more than just a deaf hyphen mute. This was her last try. Garson stared into his empty glass. Yes, Isaac is also brain damaged. There was compassion in his voice, but when he looked up, his face wore the same blank mask. And it's really near and dear to my heart, this representation that a child can understand of someone whose disability may make them appear scary is actually someone who is very gentle and kind and helpful. This was something I sometimes had to explain to my friends as a child. Someone in my family has a similar disability. And it was great to read this as a kid and see a life experience that I shared about disability in representation. So Dickory and Garson solve all these crimes. A different Garson came down the stairs. Although still unsmiling, this one seemed more sprightly, almost playful. He was carrying a paint-smeared smock, an artist's beret, and two other hats. Hats? asked Dickory, notebook in hand. Realizing it was a question, she changed her tone. Hats, she said affirmatively. You are right, Sergeant Cod. These are hats. And I am Sergeant Cod, Dickory guessed. Right again, Garson placed a Bobby's helmet on her head and a deerstacker hat on his. And you are Sherlock Holmes? Wrong, he replied. I am Inspector Nosrag. Nosrag? That was funnier than Dickory Doc. Simple, actually, 
Garson said in a near British accent. Nose rag is Garson spelled backward, almost. And cod is dock spelled backward, almost. And we are almost detectives, said Dickory. We are detectives, Sergeant Cod. I am the greatest sleuth in the universe, and you are my trusted assistant. Pacing the floor, the greatest sleuth in the universe dictated a list of art supplies to his trusted assistant, who wrote out an accurate list in spite of the difficulties she had in understanding Nose Rag's accent, which alternated between British and Humphrey Bogart. As it turns out, they're not really being enlisted for help, they're being investigated themselves. Garson's involved in a blackmailing situation, and he is a suspect in a murder. In that second to last part, the case of the disguise disguise, Dickory learns that some of the characters are not who they say they are. Some of the people who we've seen in the streets are really police detectives, and she learns that Garson's been under investigation. And she learns that Garson has been in a disguise as well. Dickory makes an uncharitable choice that lands Garson and Isaac Bickerstaff in jail. And now, at the very turn of the book, it is Dickory's turn to solve a mystery on her own. And I really enjoy the way that she does it. I really enjoy that we know all the tools that she's using. It doesn't seem impossible for her to reach the conclusions that she reaches. So this book was written in 1975, which means that a lot of things about it may be really different from what we would expect today. There may be some discussions of body size or gender or immigration that I would expect to look really differently if this book was written today, but they're also not so offensive that I feel that it's a bad book. But I do just want to clarify that this book holds up for the time it was written. Dickory's always running around looking in library books, and now we would all just Google it. There are some really great representations of disability, like Isaac Bickerstaff, and there are some not great representations, like the use of the term midget when they are um, looking for the bank robber. But in fact, there is no midget. It was a diversion. It was a diversionary tactic on the part of the real thief. One of the reasons this book is near and dear to my heart is because I relate to it so much and I see so much of my own life and experiences in it. Um, it was one of my first experiences of really good disability representation. I think it was my first mystery and I felt like I was able to follow along. If the tattooed potato piques your interest, I hope you read it even with all my spoilers. As you know, I know what happened and I keep reading it about once a year. So I really think you'll enjoy it. I hope you do. If you like this video or any of my others, please like, comment, and subscribe. Go ahead and feed that algorithm beast. If you have read The Tattooed Potato or The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin, I'd love to hear what you think of the books. I hope you liked it and come back soon. See ya!